It's been five months since the end of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and the signing of the trilateral agreement between Russia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Will those prisoners of war finally be released? Also, this day in the life of Sogolman Tellurian 100 years ago today, what was so important about April 8th 1921. Hello everyone, welcome to a Sovereign Artsakh. I'm Michael Gavlak, Hollywood guy, working on a Sogolman Tellurian project. I am the representative of the Sogolman Tellurian estate, so if you care anything about the hero of the Armenian people, you're in the right place. You're going to get some exclusive details at the very end of this episode, something no one else has ever heard before. You're going to hear it for the first time here. But before that, Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and share these videos, share this channel with other people that you think will be interested in hearing about this incredible story and what's going on. This is the behind the scenes of the Sogolman Tellurian story. It's also the update on the uh, ongoing conflict between Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Turkey. All right, so share this channel. Click like right now. That helps the algorithm. All right, I'm just going to give you a couple quick headlines and then get to what I have promised you about the Sogolman Tellurian story. All right, return of prisoners of war again delayed. Uh, the return of prisoners of war, unfortunately, is again delayed since the adversary does not implement the eighth point of the November 9th trilateral declaration, which is a gross violation of the humanitarian post-war process. Armin Press was informed from the office of Deputy Minister of Armenia, Tigran Avinyan. Negotiations under the Russian, Russian mediated uh, mediation continue, and we hope that the Azerbaijani side will finally respect the declaration and will implement the humanitarian agreement, fostering the establishment of stability in the region, reads the comment. Um, so, Pashinyan met with Putin yesterday, and today Putin called Aliyev to discuss what's going on. We can only imagine what they've talked about. Let's just read this brief. Russian President Vladimir Putin held a telephone conversation with Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev, Armin Press reports, citing the press service of the Kremlin. The sides continued discussions over the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh and further stabilization of the situation in line with the trilateral statements of November 10th, 2020 and January 11th, 2021. Particularly issues of the regional peace, security, and social economic development were addressed, as well as the process of resumption of transport communications. Mm -hmm. at, at the same time, the results of the April 7 high-level Armenian-Russian negotiations were taken into account. This article doesn't mention that they talked at all about prisoners of war. I can only assume they did, or they didn't. I don't know. But this guy, Russian Prosecutor General, departs for Bak coup from Yerevan. So while at the top level, Putin and Putin is dealing with the heads of the two nations, Armenia and Azerbaijan. They also have a man on the ground uh, doing the dirty work or the negotiations. Russian, Russian prosecutor general departs for Baku from Yerevan. So he met with the Armenian side. Now he's heading to Baku. I'd hate to be this guy trying to, <laughs> trying to deal with Aliyev uh, and his obfuscation. Uh, Prosecutor General of Russia Igor Krasnov departed from Yerevan to Baku where he will meet with the President of Azerbaijan Ilham Aliyev and Prosecutor General Kamran Aliyev Armpress was informed from the Office of the Prosecutor General of Russia. Krasnov today held meetings with Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan and Prosecutor General Artur Davtyan. In a meeting with Pashinyan, the Russian Prosecutor General highlighted the full Im implementation of the eighth point of the November 10th, 2020 trilateral de declaration, according to which exchange of POWs, hostages, and other detainees should take place. Igor Krasnov emphasized that he will spare no effort for the solution of the issue. All right, that's good. I don't hope it's just not lip service. Em Igor Krasnov emphasized that he will spare no efforts for the solution of the issue. This is the main thing outstanding. There are innocents. There are civilians as well as military personnel being held as prisoners of war under unknown conditions reports are they're not there there's torture going on this is a violation of the humanitarian international humanitarian law this needs to happen all right now i just wanted to save some time in this episode to read from this guy's memoir all right, so this is an exclusive here. Ooh, I didn't realize my... All right, 
set this up properly so it looks proper. All right. Now, uh, this picture, if you've been watching, uh, you know what I'm talking about, that this image of Sogomon was taken reportedly in Berlin, and it's possible that this was taken while he was in prison. Look at the ground here. This may be the prison yard with a backdrop canvas for photos, and he's unshaven. Now, I, I can't confirm that. Uh, I don't know if it will ever be confirmed, but... Uh, there's a high likelihood that this was taken while he was in prison awaiting his trial. Over here on the right, I'm only showing you part of it. This is a recent translation from my translator from the prison diary. Now, what's so important about April 8th, 1921? This is the day Sogomon first received paper and a writing implement on which he could record his thoughts. Now, we have an entire memoir, over 300 page memoir that Sogman wrote account, recounting in detail the events from the beginning of World War I through to his acquittal uh, in this trial. But that was written, all of that was written after the fact. A prison diary is something that's written uh, during, uh, during the events. And so it's a closer to the time of events, and it lines up mostly with his memoir. But these are the first words that Sogelman put to paper within three weeks of assassinating Talat Pasha. I'm going to read it without further ado. You're only going to see half of it. I'll read it. March 15th, 1921, in Berlin. Written on April 8th, the day he received paper for the first time. Written on April 8th, 1921, in Berlin City Jail. One other comment before I read this. 100 years ago today, Sogelman started writing his personal account. 100 years ago today, he began for the first time to write his own account of what he went through. The greatest event in history for the Armenian people, for humankind, I would say. Uh, aside from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the assassination of Talat Pasha and the acquittal of Sogomon Tellurian, uh, significant events in history that the whole world needs to know about. 100 years ago today, he began writing his personal firsthand account. And no one in that time, 100 years from when he put pencil to paper, no one came to him or his family and asked to tell his story except for me I reached out to the family three years ago and said I want to tell Sogomon's story and I said well you have to tell the truth and I said I want to base it on his point of view and they said okay and that's if you're watching this channel you are watching the authorized version of the Sogomon Tellurian story let me just read uh, this page goes on a little bit onto the next page. The first words he wrote, and he snatched the paper, forgot about his coffee for an hour or so as he just wrote down. I wake up from a horrific dream. I see the first, the sun's first rays, which slipping in through the pores of the curtain on my window wish to announce a happy morning to me. I glance at the watch on the small table next to my bed. It's 8.25. I light a cigarette and start to smoke it in my bed, but I'm anxious and my mind is tormented, overwhelmed by heavy ruminations that have resulted from the dreadful impressions left by my dream. I, call, I recall what my ancestors have said about dreams, that often bad ones can have a good meaning wishing to convince myself for a moment that what my forefathers have said is true, I interpret my dream as being auspicious. Get out of bed and begin to get dressed in a happy mood. It's ten past nine. I request that the servant bring me breakfast. The food is ready within a few minutes. Yet for some reason, I have no appetite, where I has, whereas I have relished eating breakfast the previous mornings. That dream... It's that wretched dream that haunts me. I pour myself a cup of tea. Perhaps I'll be able to drink it. But no, I can't bring myself to have tea either. 
Meanwhile, my eyes long to gaze at the street where, in either direction, people walk hastily on their way to work. Not even the time spent walking do they want to go to waste. There are morning papers in the hands of some. Thus, they would be abreast of the day's latest news by the time they reach the work, their workplaces. Others, being late to work, eat their breakfast while walking. And so, the endless bustle of the street draws me in, piques my curiosity to the point of taking away my appetite for breakfast, which consists of a variety of dishes as well as tea, all placed on my table. I just take a few sips of the tea, leave the food untouched, and approach the window in order to watch the passers-by more closely and search among them for someone who could tell me the real meaning of my dream. Plunged into an armchair by my window, and with my eyes fixed on the street, I'm carried away by the swells of boundless and profound reveries coalescing into their bottomless depths. In my ensuing oblivion, I begin to have a second lucid dream, a dream which has been the yearning of the hearts of many, a dream which has created for me a new chapter, a new life, a dream which is the rightful restitution sought by the voice of vengeance and protest raised by the bones left from the unburied corpses of innumerable innocent martyrs, bones and interminable bones abandoned across parched deserts, bones whose sounds of sobbing were what I heard in my dream last night. It's eleven o'clock. I find myself at the corner of Hardenburg and Fassenen streets, surrounded by a mob, some among which hold me firmly by the arms. I glance at the faces of these people. They are all staring at me threateningly. I don't know why. What has happened to these people to make them raise their fists and want to kill me, whereas I neither know nor have anything to do with any of them? I don't even, don't even understand their language. Meanwhile, I realize that I have a terrible headache and some kind of liquid is dripping down my cheeks. It is my own blood flowing from my forehead to my cheeks and from my neck to my torso once again to paint in red the body which, having escaped the sea of blood, had just finished draining its very source. I want the police, I scream in German, of course. Suddenly a man among the crowd walks up to me and tells me he's a police detective. This is when I seem to take heart as I begin to hope that I'll be able to break free of the crowd. Encouraged by the det detective's presence, I manage to find a few words and shout out in my broken German, I am a foreigner, and my business is with a foreigner. I have nothing against Germans. Once I say this, the crowd calms down a bit, while the policemen keep arriving from every street. Taking hold of my arms on either side, two policemen escort me down Hardenburg Street. Barely fifteen or twenty steps later, we come across a densely thronged multitude of onlookers. As we pass by them, I peer at them to see why they've gathered at that particular spot. That's when I see a corpse lying on the ground amid the onlookers' feet, whose blood has painted the entire width of the sidewalk black. As I step across the pool of blood, my feet rub against the ground, seemingly of their own accord, in order to be painted with that appalling blood, the, whose detestable stench I could very much smell at that moment. Okay. These are the first words he, write, he writes after three weeks in a prison cell. I'm going to at least just leave it here, all right? I'm going to pick up, I, I'm going to read some more of this in the days to come, but um, I'm going to leave off here. Click subscribe, share this video, and click the like button now.